Think Forward. Think Research Channel. America's rivers and streams, magnificent ribbons of water, they've provided the pathways and the power for the country's growth and prosperity. And they have provided unique habitat to plants and animals critical to this country's natural wealth. But these waterways are now under attack from threats both seen and unseen. And we are learning that protecting them means protecting the land around them, the stream side, to ensure their future health. On a small Appalachian mountain farm, landowner Jim Klaus watches as a team of state and federal conservationists lines the bank of his stream with cedar trees harvested from elsewhere on the farm. These cedar reinforcements are called revetments, and the team drills an anchor for each tree deep into the stream bank to secure the tree in times ahead when the river will rise and flood. The cedars will protect the bank and capture silt and sediment to add to its strength. The cedar trees are, are essentially protecting the toe of the bank and they will do that for, for several years, probably five to ten years perhaps. And what we'll do in the springtime, late winter, early spring, we'll come back in and between where the, the toe of the bank is, between where the cedar trees are and the bank itself, We'll plant young uh, trees, uh, saplings. Also, we'll put in a lot of willow stakes, about a foot long or so, that we'll drive in. And the intent is to get little trees started at the base of the bank so that they don't get washed out with the next flood that comes down. And, and the cedar trees protect them in that sense. Through state and federal cost-sharing programs, Klaus is getting some financial help to pay for the project, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Agriculture are among the agencies with cost-sharing programs to restore stream banks. Most of his share of the cost comes in the form of in-kind contributions, cutting and hauling the cedars to the stream side, for example. Klaus's farm is typical. Pasturing or tilling the land close to the edge of the stream bank has been a common practice to get the most agricultural use out of a stream valley's flat bottom land. But that extra-tilled land is often lost, washed downstream during floods. Without some sort of vegetative anchor, such as the roots of trees and grasses, the stream bank is easily washed away, and Klaus has watched his property literally float downstream. There's a lot of problems, really, with owning land, particularly on this river. A uh, flood is the first one. Uh, for example, all the flat ground around us, two or three times a year will be underwater. So that's one concern. The other one is stream bank erosion, particularly, and the stream tends to undercut, and then chunks of the bank will fall off. As you may have seen, uh, some of the sycamore trees and other trees here tend to be sitting out in the water almost, or about that, and so you have a real problem with stream bank erosion. The team is taking a holistic approach to the problem. By the next spring, fencing parallels the river to keep cows from trampling the stream's banks, and willow and other saplings, along with grasses, are planted along its edge to reinforce the revetments and hold the streamside soil in place when the floods inevitably come. Such restoration takes time, and we'll come back and visit the Klaus farm two years after the revetments were installed. But why all this effort? Why the change to protect streamside or riparian areas after years of building or farming right up to the water's edge? There are many answers. Among them, wildlife. Well, these are important areas because they have preserved the natural functions of the system. Uh, and that provides for several important aspects related to wildlife. One is that it's going, going to provide the habitat that they will utilize, and that spans several times during the year. But the animals certainly will respond to that. They'll have a diversity of food. They'll have a diversity of different habitat types in one narrow area. Uh, relative to the surrounding matrix. Uh, and so it becomes an attractant to them. And in fact, we know that many species depend on these areas for their movement corridors. Um, birds in the springtime tend to follow these corridors as they move north, north from the, the wintering grounds. It's 
one of the major travel zones that some of our larger mammals use. Black bears frequently will use the riparian corridors to move from point A to point B. Bobcats, raccoons, many of our larger mammals will utilize them. So they are sort of like nature's highways in many cases and very heavily used. And what's on the side of the stream also affects what's in the stream. Obviously, you want something that is going to provide some shading to the stream system so we're protecting the, the temperature and the quality in the system for the aquatic organisms. So in most cases, buffers on the stream side are probably going to contain some element of woody vegetation, shrubs and trees. And we are learning that those trees beside the water also have a role in the quality of the water and the health and diversity of the life it holds. A team of Virginia Tech professors and students is reversing a trend of the last century. A lot of effort used to be made to take downed trees and logs out of streams to improve their flow. Now a lot of effort is being made to put them back. Back in the 1950s and 60s with uh, the development of environmental consciousness, large wood in the streams meant things like slash and debris from logging. And we did a very good job, we being the Forest Service and uh, the federal government, of removing all of that material from the streams mandating that it all be taken out. In the mid to late 70s, however, the uh, biologists started to take a close look at large woody debris and what was large woody debris actually doing in a stream. If you think about it, trout and other fish have evolved with streams that have a lot of wood material in them. So it doesn't really make sense to be pulling a lot of that out. And in fact, research studies have borne that out and shown that to be true. This large woody debris gives the fish water insects and other animal life, habitat, shelter, and food. Wood in the stream is as important as wood around it, if fish and other aquatic creatures are to thrive. But while woody debris is vital to life in a stream, silt and chemicals and nutrients are not. And without sufficient streamside vegetation, these pollutants from farms and from cities and towns clog our waterways, and life within the stream can be wiped out. As much life as we see above the stream, there is often much, much more in it. There are bass and trout, of course, fish familiar to most of us, but there are in this country hundreds of other species, species such as the stone roller, the red-bellied dace, and the blotch-side log perch. And streams provide habitat for other creatures as well. The southeastern United States is home to the largest collection of freshwater mussel species in the world. 270 species, or 90 percent, of the mussels found in all of North America. These simple creatures filter the water for their food, and when the water is full of silt and chemicals, the mussels suffer. Dozens of species are endangered or already extinct. Their situation is so precarious, mussel experts have tried to breed them in the laboratory and then restock them into the waters in which they once thrived. This restocking is taking place in the Clinch Valley Bioreserve in Tennessee. Now you can go out and take a water quality sample and it's going to tell you something, but for a mussel that's spending its whole life buried in the bottom, and a lot of these mussels live as long as human beings or longer. They're the ultimate monsters of what's going on in the water. And their decline here is telling us that even the remote waters of the southeast are suffering from poor water quality. While this project looks to strengthen mussel populations in the river here, more must be done. The species depends on the habitat, and if you've got the right kind of habitat, then you can, you can bring these species back. And so we're working sort of in a two-pronged approach. One is to restore the habitat, and, and the other is to, is to bring the species back. But how much difference can protecting or buffering a stream's banks make? Tons of difference, quite literally. Looks can be deceiving. These farmers and foresters appear to be getting soaked, but they are on the edge of a massive rainfall simulation set up by Cooperative Extension and forestry officials. Agricultural engineer Blake Ross runs the simulator with one goal in mind, reducing the amount of soil and chemicals in that soil that flow into our waterways. Ross has set up side-by-side -side plots. One has vegetation, the other 
has been left bare. As the simulated rain continues to fall, the difference between the two plots is clear. With just minimal protection, erosion is reduced more than 98% in the buffered plot. We've measured up to a ton and a half on a per acre basis. Uh, about 3,000 pounds of actual soil material leaving an area of the size of an acre, which is pretty significant. And at the same time where we've had the uh, stabilized road, we've had that uh, cover there to protect that soil. Uh, in that particular example I mentioned, we measured only 62 pounds of soil lost off an entire acre. So tremendous differences, about 50 times as much soil coming off one area as the other. Ross takes his rainfall simulator on the road often, demonstrating that in whatever situation, valuable soil can be retained and valuable waterways can be protected with some very small efforts to reduce erosion. Where there is no effort, there is often erosion and subsequent water pollution. The Soil and Water Conservation Society estimates an average five to seven tons of soil loss per acre per year from runoff. Among the biggest problems of streamside or riparian areas are simply cows. Traditionally, farmers have used streams as a primary watering source for their cattle. As a result, the heavy-bodied cows break down the stream banks, getting in and out. They trample fish and other underwater life and tear up the stream bed, and they pollute the water with the waste they leave behind. Steve Smith is an aquatic medicine veterinarian at the Virginia Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine. Yes, sir. Um, in addition to just complete turbidity of the water, increasing the turbidity of it, um, you also have the contamination with a lot of the bacteria that are in the fecal material, which is also then passed into the waterway and passed downstream. And fellow veterinarian Ernest Hoving, a large animal specialist, also says constant contact with water may not be so good for the cattle. I think common sense dictates that if we see that the cattle are spending a lot of time in the water, if they're you know, making a mess of the stream bed and the stream banks, um, if there's a lot of manure going into that area, then I think we do have to you know, make sure that those cattle don't access that area. Recognizing that the convenience of using a stream as a watering hole may hurt the cattle as well as the stream, biologists and extension agents are teaming up with farmers to rethink the way livestock are watered. At Greenview Dairies, Danny Wampler has made it a point to separate his livestock from his ponds and streams. The cows now travel a fenced path on their daily trips to and from the dairy barn. Wampler set up mechanical watering holes in the middle of his pastures, convenient to his cows and protective of his water resources. He rotates his cows among different pastures to reduce erosion. I couldn't be more pleased with it. Uh, about three years ago, we shifted our total emphasis to cow comfort and, and you know, putting the cows first. And uh, we can get them over to an area like this without going through any mud and, and that type of thing. And uh, we've decreased our runoff uh, you know, into streams and ponds and so forth. Extension agent Jerry Swisher has been working with Wampler and other farmers to get cattle and mud and waste out of area streams. One target of his is the so-called loafing lot, a place where cows hang out, some waiting for the next milking. Loafing lots are often crowded, wet, and muddy messes. And although some are away from a stream, a heavy rain will carry tons of loafing lot manure and mud downhill into the closest waterway. One of Swisher's projects is rotating cattle among three loafing lots at the Ron Rue Holstein Farm in Spring Hill. And by having three grass paddocks, we can rotate these cows from one grass paddock to the other. This gives the dairyman the flexibility to manage the lot system so that he does not destroy the sod and maintains a healthy, strong, vigorous sod at all times. There are many advantages to this system. Uh, I, I guess one of the biggest advantages is the fact that it does help to reduce soil erosion significantly. The reduction in soil loss is, is significant in many ways. It takes about 150 to 175 years to make an inch of topsoil. So that shows the very real and vivid significance and impact of this system. The other side of this thing is, is that if you're having a fairly significant amount of soil erosion, the phosphorus is tied to the sediment. And when that goes into the stream, you can end up with eutrophication where you increase the nutrient load in that stream, which tends to grow the algae and, and plants, and then that destroys the fish habitat, and it, uh, uh, that can be a real problem. 
While loafing lots and cows and streams are big concerns, issues affecting the water quality of our rivers and streams are not just limited to farms and fields. Indeed, urban areas present their own special challenges, and the need for a buffer along city streams and rivers is even more critical. Whether large or small, any growing town is a potential threat. As a city grows, each new business or home means another roof and another parking lot or driveway, channeling rainwater runoff into its creeks and streams. There are a lot of potential contamination and pollutants to waterways, including um, homeowner usage of insecticides and pesticides, golf courses using um, the same kind of compounds, chemical companies, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of different um, types of pollution that can be added to water systems. As development occurs in a uh, you know, watershed, um, what we see are more and more non-porous surfaces. And uh, non-porous surfaces include things like parking lots, um, roofs, rooftops, amazingly enough, contribute to that. And in a, in a well-planned city, we often will see a, a heavy network of drainages, of um, sewer storm drains that are all connected together. And eventually, all of that water winds up somewhere. And in this town, part of that water winds up right here in this channel. And so um, when you have fewer and fewer porous surfaces, now the water runs off much quicker. Years of ignoring our rivers and streams has meant years of degrading their quality. Many urban areas have channelized their streams, sending them down a virtual rock line to shoot so that in times of heavy rain, they speed the river along to cause more damage downstream. As more runoff results from more development, urban areas often try to patch up problems after they occur. These rock cages, called gabions, were installed by this town to try to control erosion along the stream. What they often do is send flood water along at a higher rate of speed, causing more erosion problems downstream. The gabions alongside the stream, they do their job very well. They hold the stream bank in place, but what happens is as the water runs in, it is confined to that channel and it starts to move downstream much quicker. Well, pretty soon, you don't get too many of those events as the water runs down much quicker, and now you've got another problem downstream. And so what's the natural response there but to put in more gabion structures or more rip wrap on the rocks along the stream? And so as we do that, we continue to move the problem downstream. We transfer. We transfer the stream's power downstream, and that stream can actually build up more power under that scenario than it would have without those gabions in place. So we start seeing downstream effects um, that include things like erosion and heavier sedimentation. And not to mention the fact that those gabion areas aren't the greatest places for fish. Newcomb is a fisheries professor at Virginia Tech. And on this day, she is teaching her class about water quality with a hands-on approach. Her macroinvertebrate shuffle is designed to stir up the stream bottom, dislodging any crayfish or insects or similar creatures within about a one meter square area into the net. Students then scour the net to see what kind of life exists on the creek's bottom. It is a method being adopted nationwide through the Save Our Streams program to allow average citizens a chance to monitor their hometown streams and creeks Counting the number and types of stream insects to determine a stream's relative health, this sampling can often detect problems usually found only through expensive chemical analysis of the water. These organisms have different levels of sensitivity to pollution, which is well documented. So we know that a stonefly needs good oxygen levels in a good quality creek, can't tolerate a lot of toxics. An aquatic worm or a leech, no problem. Toxics, uh, there's a red worm that can live for three days with no oxygen at all. So we know what their tolerances are, and in a healthy creek we hope to find a lot of sensitive organisms like stoneflies, mayflies, and caddisflies with very few of the tolerant organisms. So we can go in the creek and look and hopefully get the sensitive ones. If we get a whole net full of leeches and worms, that tells us there's something wrong with the creek. Just a half mile or so downstream from where that creek Newcomb spoke of is in such bad shape, there is evidence that improvements can be made. While not perfect, the stream here is cleaner and its natural twists and turns harbor wildlife. About 10 years ago, we started putting up fencing alongside both sides of the channel to keep the cattle out, keep the sheep out, and prevent a lot of the bank erosion that was occurring. And what's happened as a result in this very short time period is that we've got um, water willow that has come in and is now about 10 feet tall. Um, the vegetation along the channel has really taken hold. Uh, we have nice, very nice meanders in the channel. It now is a channel that has deeper pools and shallower riffles, and oh, there are fish just rose. 
More and more people are recognizing the importance of streamside or riparian preservation and restoration. Groups such as the Nature Conservancy have helped landowners fence off their streams from livestock. And even in the inner city, efforts are being made to restore what has been neglected for decades, often creating parks alongside streams. Lick Run in Roanoke, Virginia, runs out from under what used to be a landfill. Water quality is a major and perhaps even insurmountable issue, but efforts are being made to restore Lick Run's appearance and its banks. Then we come in, we go like this, back and forth, and the dance all around. Now, why again are we doing this? Why are we doing the stream dance? Yeah, because we these fourth graders from Lincoln Terrace Elementary School are learning well. about Lick Run, about why it is the way it is and about how it can be improved. You know, for all intents and purposes, they think it's a normal looking stream and it's always been like this. So it's real important to get them a grasp at what is wrong with this stream, the fact that it is not healthy, the fact that we do have soil sloughing off into the river and just exacerbating the problems that already exist here. Michael Van Ness's Western Virginia Land Trust and the Inner City Coalition for Selective Development are teaming up to try to restore the creek and teach students about the environment at the same time. I remember coming in this creek and playing in it. So it has a lot of uh, sentimental value about this creek. And, and uh, so getting involved with this and, and, and um, getting it tested and getting the environmental people getting involved in this, this is great because I like to see the fishes, and I like to see the wildlife in here like it, like it should be. And so, the next spring, the students return to take the first steps to restore Lick Run. They planted trees, trees that will one day hold the soil and keep the creek bank from eroding. The effort will teach the students that, while it will happen slowly, there will be change for the better. But that kid can come back 30 years later and bring his child and say, this is my tree. I planted this when I was in the fourth grade. And I think that, I just love that. That is so fantastic. This kind of educational effort signifies a changing attitude in America. And more and more children and landowners are becoming aware of the role healthy riparian areas play in the health of the streams they line. Deep in the heart of the Appalachians, Creed Taylor wades in to fish Big Walker Creek. Taylor owns 100 acres and a mile of streamside, part of the 6,000 acres his family acquired here before the American Revolution. The family used the power of the creek to grind grain and saw timber. This footing is all that remains of the mill, dismantled during World War II for its valuable tin. The fishing is good, even better than it used to be. About 20 years ago, uh, I doubt that any of the houses along the uh, creek upstream all the way down to the river, to the new river, um, had uh, anything other than plumbing that drained directly into the creek, making it nutrient rich also of a different kind. And uh, that of course was all ended when uh, we had the common sense as a country to put in septic systems. Since the cleanup of the river, Taylor has seen an increased diversity of wildlife. There are otter, which we worked with the uh, Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries and the Forest Service to reintroduce them. And this was one of the spots that they picked as suitable for habitat. And uh, we planted, I think it was 17. And out of that, uh, a few survived. And there are now, I think, three or four families, extended otter families, which are fantastic to watch. And um, beaver, mink, muskrat, uh, countless songbirds. For Taylor, the concern is much more than good fishing, much more than what happens along his property. It travels about another 40 miles down to the New River, at which point uh, uh, the New flows into the Kanawha, then the Ohio, the Mississippi, and uh, eventually, of course, the Gulf of Mexico. The mile or so of creek frontage that we've got, and several neighbors upstream and downstream, I'll look at it as something, uh, a responsibility to protect it and preserve it and practice the best farming management and land management development, that kind of thing, um, as, as possible, knowing that it all winds up downstream. Taylor's deep concern for Big Walker Creek and the waters below it are typical of a new way of thinking among many landowners. 
Back at the Klaus farm, two years after putting in those cedar revetments, Jim Klaus sees an obvious improvement in his stretch of the North Fork of the Roanoke River. His investment of time and of money have paid off. We've been very pleased. Uh, as you know, we fenced uh, the river so that no livestock could get to it. But uh, in terms of stabilizing the bank, it's been great. It really has done the job. We see a lot more wildlife up and down the river than we used to, too. Uh, deer mainly, but there's also uh, muskrat around, uh, a lot of possum and other animals, too. Jim Klaus and Creed Taylor are just two of the millions of Americans whose land runs along streams and rivers. While other landowners show the same commitment, many more still are unconcerned or unaware of the importance of buffering their streams by building up a belt of vegetation alongside them. There is work to be done. Community-based groups and conservation organizations, such as the Nature Conservancy, the Isaac Walton League, and Trout Unlimited are helping individual landowners plant trees, put up fences, and preserve existing streamside vegetation. And state and federal agencies are helping landowners as well. A lot of them are concerned about the loss of stream banks as well because it's their land that's ending up going in the river. <clears throat> and so we can, we can offer, offer these, uh, these landowners financial incentives to help them provide funding to, to get this work done. So we might, uh, if there were cattle that were getting into the stream, we could put up some fences to keep the cattle out of the stream. If it, if it was a raw bank that was eroding away, getting into their cropland, we could, we could stabilize that bank. Well, a healthy system in its natural state is probably going to give us the best diversity that we would have under natural conditions. Um, again, we're trying to preserve all of those functions that we know exist in these systems, things that will provide the, the cover, the food sources, uh, the shading, the, the, um, the organic material that comes into the stream system, the filtering of the materials that come off the uplands, that's all going to contribute to the wealth of animals that we find in these zones. America's rivers and streams, providing the basis of life for creatures great and small, and for us. And while they face threats to their beauty and their quality, the growing numbers of responsible landowners protecting the streamside will help guarantee that they remain magnificent ribbons of water for generations to come.